Coming up on Influencing Entrepreneurs. We forgave errors of commission and never forgave errors of omission. In other words, the one thing that wouldn't sit well was doing nothing and hoping things got better. We, we, we wanted action. After years of teaching entrepreneurship and consulting with numerous companies, I realized that when business leaders shared stories of their success, hardships, and mistakes, it always had an impact in the classroom. So I thought, why not share these real-life business cases for education and inspiration? I'm Kazmer Ward, and this is Influencing Entrepreneurs. On today's episode, we speak with Hugh McCall, Hugh McCall is a fourth generation banker and the former chairman and CEO of Bank of America. Active in banking since around 1960, McCall was a driving force behind consolidating a series of progressively larger, mostly southern banks, thrifts, and financial institutions into a super regional banking force. The first ocean to ocean bank in the nation's history. Tony Plath, Director of Banking Studios at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, described this transformation in 2005 as the most significant banking story of the late 20th century. In a general sense, what I guess my first question is, is what does entrepreneurship mean to you? Well, I think entrepreneurship to me really just means taking an idea and turning it into a business or a way to make money. and. Uh, doing something maybe that nobody else has done, creating something from nothing, basically. So you started your career, you, uh, you came back from the military, and, and you went into to banking. You're kind of known as Charlotte's premium entrepreneur. Did you start from scratch? No, uh, I don't know if that's the way to put it. Um, I had never thought I would need a job when I was in college because my family had an empire in a little tiny town. You know, we owned the banks and we were cotton merchants and we were farmers. And I always thought I'd go home and run the business. And then um, I was about a week from getting out, a month, maybe a month from getting out of the Marine Corps. And my, uh, my father said, son, what are you going to do when you get out of the Marine Corps? And I said, I thought I'd come home and help you. And he said, we're getting along fine without you. You better go get a job. And he said, you, you need to go to the American Trust Company in Charlotte and get a job. So he said, go into banking. And um, so I came up and interviewed, got turned down. They, it was one of those, don't call us, we'll call you. And I didn't give a damn. I'd won $45,000 in a pot limit poker game on an aircraft carrier <laughs> after we invaded Lebanon. And so I was rich by all intents and purposes in those days. I told him, I'm going to Europe. Southern Marine and I decided to tag some girls, follow us a group of girls from South Carolina, Converse and USC. He called the bank and said, we understand you don't want to, you, the chairman said, I understand you don't want to hire my son. And he said, of, of course we do because we were big customers. And that's how, I, I, I'm not proud of how I got my job, but that's how I got my job. So I came, I met this girl on June the 3rd, married on October the 3rd, came to work on September 1st, so I've been at work one month when I got married. And I went from thinking I was rich to um, working for $4,500 a year and at the bottom. And since nobody really wanted me, they made it difficult for me. So it made me work harder and I did whatever came up, whatever I was asked to do. And um, so the rest is history. I went up pretty rapidly. And I appreciate you saying, you know, I'm, I'm not proud of how I got my foot in the door. However, you kept your foot in the door. You got all the way in. You, you don't keep the status that you have today by just getting lucky once. So how did you build on from that opportunity? Truthfully, I, I didn't, I majored in banking and finance and I really, though, didn't understand a thing that was going on in this company I'd come to work for. <laughs> Nothing prepared me for it. And so I took every job they gave me. The training program was very thorough. I learned all about the company, about how it actually worked. And um, a difficult problem came up and I volunteered to try to solve it. And uh, I did solve it. And it was in an area I knew nothing about. Um, it was in the trust department's insurance on the properties that they were responsible for and had lapsed and they'd had a person that hadn't been doing their job. And so I solved that problem and that sort of 
got me my start of being somebody could solve a problem. And that sort of stayed with me through all the jobs I got that if it was something difficult, I would either volunteer for it or get assigned to take care of it. And um, really that's how I, I was willing to work whatever hours and do whatever it took to get ahead. And so that's what I did. And one night I was working late and the chairman came out and said, he looked around, he said, you, he didn't know my name or he'd forgotten it, said, come in here. And he needed somebody to help him get ready for merger discussions. I'd been with the bank about three or four years by then, three years maybe. It was my first real job I was sitting out there working on as an analyst. And um, so I helped him and I drove him to the merger negotiations the next day, actually participated in the sort of halfway. Uh, the next day he came, to, first he announced he was gonna have this merger, then he called me in and said, we gotta get out of it, I got a, a conflict because we got a better deal just down the road. So I went back and got by myself and worked out, us out of that merger. And from then on, I was in on every merger team we had from the rest of my career. So this happened when I was about 27. And um, then until I was 66, I was the guy that was in charge of buying everybody. So I, I just was very good at it, very good at negotiating and very good at getting along with older people at the time. And so that's kind of how I got started. <laughs> What would be some of your biggest wins? Was it being in the right place at the right time? Or surely you performed that were bigger victories? Well, of course, uh, I guess the way I really made my name in the company was subsequently I, I rose in the company, in the division I was in fairly rapidly. And you have to understand the times that I, I went to work in, it was after the, after the Second World War, basically. After, and I went to work in 1959. And you could argue I was part of the group that would be the man in the gray flannel suit. I was willing to make decisions. I'd come out of the Marine Corps. When you've been in the Marine Corps, you learn to make decisions. You don't think, oh my goodness, what do we do now? You just make a decision. And I found that I was one of the few people, we'd be in a meeting and I would be the junior most person there and they'd be talking about what they might do. And I'd say, why don't we do this? And within a year or so, or maybe even quicker, people would turn around and look at me like, what do you think? Even though I would be junior. And so I was willing to make decisions and pretty soon people were deferring to me to make decisions. So that had something to do with confidence, willing to make decisions. The thing I believe is that you never ask someone to do something you won't do yourself. And if it's really difficult over time and things like that, you should be working beside them. When you ask people to work weekends, you should be working the weekend. So I was, that was just how I ran my career. I never wanted to be anything but in charge. I wanted to be president. A lot of people wanted to be the best lending officer, the best investing officer. Never occurred to me to be, want to be anything but in charge. That's really what I wanted to do. Very early on, I found that we were small and that the Big business, a good business was all going to New York or to Wachovia, which had been a branch bank for quite a long time. We were really a single unit bank. I decided early in my career that we had to change that. And so I, I spent a, most of my years in the job trying to build the biggest bank in the world. I thought, you know, if you're gonna be big, why not be the biggest? If I had an entrepreneurial spirit, it was to not be little. Let's circle back to how we started this. You'd mentioned that the entrepreneur is, is uh, somebody who has a vision and is able to get things done. I see in the corporate world, um, in small business, and even in the classroom, people will put in a year full of work and research and still not make a decision. I felt that I might be disadvantaged from not having a uh, graduate degree. And there was a guy that had a graduate degree who was on the same training program as me. And, we were parallel for a while. He was a perfect example of a person that 
never gets enough facts. He kept gathering and gathering. He never could make a decision and he never went anywhere. And I think somewhere after four, five, six, seven years with the company, he was gone. But I think that what you really learn is that most of what you accomplish in life, you do through other people. And if you can't influence other people and um, lead, lead them to go in the direction you want to go in, uh, then you're not going to be very successful because uh, one person by themselves is not going to make it happen. And what I think the greatest thing I accomplished was to um, surround myself with really talented people, attract talented people, give them their heads, let them run, um, aim them right. in the right direction. That was really the secret of our success, not my success, but of our success as a team. I always wanted all my children to be quarterbacks because what you learn as a quarterback is you say, you come up to the line and you say down and everybody gets down and then you call the signal and then when you say go, everybody goes. And it's great training on being in charge, being quarterback. You decide where we the play and then you decide when we're going to attack and then you attack. So, and you do it together, because no one person in a football team wins for you. Everybody's got to be doing the job. So, I mean, I, I, th I think a lot like that. If, if I look at all the people that work for me, the common denominator, they were all smart. So smart won the separator. The separator was aggressiveness and decision-making and tact. People that motivated themselves. So leading from being the quarterback and being the one that makes decisions, uh, which you started with a smaller bank, but as you start building the biggest bank, you ultimately have several football teams working under you. How is it for you making that transition to now empower other decision makers? Never really had any problem with delegation. It's, um, I believe in, I, we never had any computers or any handheld devices, so everything we did was face to face. I really didn't write memos. I would talk to somebody and say, this is what we want to do. And I'd have confidence in my teammate that they could go do that. Then I didn't try to tell them how to do it. So all I cared about was if we were going to take this hill, that they took the hill. I didn't give a damn about how they got there. So they could take it any way they wanted to. So you empower them that they're able to make decisions. Yes. I'm assuming you're also empowering them to be okay with making a mistake. We forgave errors of commission and never forgave errors of omission. In other words, the one thing that wouldn't sit well was doing nothing and hoping things got better. We, we, we wanted action. And so, yes, we would forgive you for making the wrong decision if it was attacking. Uh, the Marine Corps always had this uh, great saying, which I, is really my entire life I've lived is when in doubt, attack. And when every time my company was more or less in trouble, we would attack, we would go do something, we'd go buy somebody, we'd do something to change the picture. Where we're at today, you, you know, you, you, you built the biggest bank. In the state of that bank or other corporations that are just as large, is there room for uh, entrepreneurial mindset throughout the corporate corporation rather than just at the top? No, there has to be. Um, and if you want to, or your company's going to die, if you keep doing yesterday's story, and even if you're doing it well, it, it, it may not work. And so you need, you need innovative people throughout your company that are figuring out a better way to do their part of what it is you're doing, or to say, hey, this is really dumb, we should go here. And you've got to give them leeway to do that. And you, you've got, they, people have to feel like their ideas will be listened to and at least evaluated fairly. And I always say that probably the most innovative thing we ever did at the bank was create what we call the model bank. And it was out of step with everybody in the country. And so the, the um, bank one was supposed to be the model where they they would buy up a bank, but they'd let everybody stay in place and they keep their own identity and they didn't have to lose their love for themselves. And um, we were the 180 out from that. We were gonna have one company that, and we built systems that we did everything exactly alike. And while we were building these systems, we made them the systems keep books for us so that we eliminated a massive amount of uh, people, that, bookkeepers and what have you, and we let the systems do that. And so every time we'd buy somebody, we'd just 
put them in our model bank and the transitions were fast and successful. And we knew immediately where we were because our system produced results, the accounting and, and, and management information for us. So that was the, the, the building of that system, which was so different from our image. No one really believed. They thought we were just gunfighters that took great credit risk, et cetera. But we really were technically quite competent. And today, the Bank of America's real strength is it's way ahead technologically. Building that infrastructure, being able to adapt and grow at a, at a sustainable rate. We don't hear a lot of that from our, our business leaders in banking, outside of banking. We see a lot of, we, they take their entrepreneurial leadership roles and it comes down to earnings per share. Right. May I get your opinion on that? Well, yeah, you can surely, I think that I never made, I can say this, that in all the years I ran the company, I was there 42 years and 27 of those years, I was either president or chairman. I was chairman for 17 years. I never maximized earnings. We, were, we maybe have tried to optimize earnings and have good earnings growth, but we were plowing back money into R&D and into technology all the time, always upgrading our systems, and always building better systems. People, have lost the ability to do that. And if you really want to know my opinion, I think if you can't think of anything to do with your capital except buy back your stock, then you really, they need a new CEO to speak. But truthfully, you should be trying to build, expand your business and plow that capital into money-making operations, not buying back your shares. This makes no sense to me. One of the biggest problems in America today is we're generating great wealth. Uh, in our corporations, but we're not really developing a whole lot of new businesses and a new, and so I think that then causes, eventually it causes your economy to flip over. And so it's certainly true of companies. If they can't figure out what to do with their money, they'll eventually die. Currently one of the big things that's in the news is Apple, who's got large cash reserves yeah. and they're going into the credit card business. <laughs> is that an innovative way to grow their business? I, sh I guess I should, don't have an informed opinion, but it's certainly not innovative. It's trying to get in a business that's already saturated and dominated by big players who have enough capital to fight off anybody. Particularly if you're fighting a company like um, the two big banks, the three or four big banks, they can charge nothing if they want to. I mean, they can, they can make it painful. <laughs> I, I, I've done that. <laughs> Being the quarterback, um, leading it, and, and you, you said, um, when in doubt, attack. What were some of the challenges throughout your career of building this large bank? Well, we had several periods of trouble. One of the things I found myself, I guess my biggest managerial challenge was about 1987. We had had a tough year. The market had decided it didn't like us as much as it, it had been in love with us from, for a while, but they, the market was down on us and we had real estate losses. And at the end of 1987, uh, we decided to charge off all our foreign debt. And we wanted a few banks that was willing to do that. We charged off a couple of hundred million dollars worth of foreign debt that was in trouble like Argentina and Brazil and Mexico and cleaned up the balance sheet. And we were sort of not happy. There were no bonuses that year. We, we never paid bonuses. We had, we'd have a profit plan. If you didn't make it, we, it was like a cliff. You, it was zero if you didn't make the plan. And um, so we did that two or three times, not make the plan, but it was a painful year. And um, what was worse was I had a very powerful management team I'd put together, but it was, we had too, almost too much talent and not enough to do for everybody to do. So my team was starting to unravel. And so that was probably one of the biggest years of challenge for me. And we went into the new year really with a lot of worries. And that's when we, Texas started getting in trouble. Banks had failing. First Republic 
Republic and, and first, first Interstate merged. It was like, was described as two drunks trying to hold themselves up in a bar. And um, we went after them, went after First Republic. No one gave us a chance. City Corp was after them, Wells Fargo was after them. At that time, they were larger than we were. Ended up taking over Texas. At that time, we'd been in business. So we went after that out of the biggest problem I had. Of course, what we did was, we were about a $30 billion company at the time, and we ended up buying a 35, taking over a $35 billion company. Suddenly I had something for my management to do. We had been in business 114 years, and our tangible net worth was a billion dollars, and we got $5.6 billion in tax benefits when we took over the company. Our lawyers figured it out, nobody else's did. And so we went from being bums on the street our stock soaring. It went from 12 to 36. Wow. And uh, I, saw, I was able to sell stock at, um, I went all over the world trying to borrow $200 million to buy the Texas, buy into the Texas deal. I was willing to give up 25% of my company and get, nobody would do it. So long story short, I ended up borrowing it from manufacturers Hanover and we did the deal and the stock went to 50 and then up, split it, went to 100. Anyhow, we got rich, we made everybody around us rich, and it gave us a currency then to really attack the market. From there, you build the largest bank. One of the greatest entrepreneurial endeavors of the Charlotte area, but really your best entrepreneurial endeavors are what you have given to this community. So when do you start using your leadership role outside of the bank? Well, I can pinpoint it exactly in, in 1975. I, uh, we had, the bank had nearly failed in 1974. I helped, like a lot of my team did, we dug it out. We had found something else to do. I'd been made president. Uh, it sounds like a bigger role than it was. I wasn't president of the corporation. I was president of the bank, and but I had, more energy and drive than I had things to do. And so it got me interested in developing uptown. And so that's when we first built the, started building in Fourth Ward. It was a high interest rate period. And what we did was we were selling money at 6% in a 13% world. And the way we were doing that, we were making loans to the city and the city would pass the loan through to the bar, so we got it was tax free. So we took advantage of the tax laws, and so that's when I first got interested in it. And re there were a lot of reasons for that. I'd spent ten years running the out of town divisions, correspondent banking, national vision, international vision. So I'd never lived here. I mean, I'd lived here, but I never really worked here. Never had any friends here. Nothing. The bank started growing, and I grew with it in responsibilities and. Um, I realized that the people I wanted to hire were living in cities like New York and Chicago and London and Johannesburg and San Francisco and Hong Kong. And I, trying to attract them to Charlotte was impossible. It was so boring and, and dead. And so that's got me interested in building the city. You could argue that the real start of it came when I really made a difference was after I became chairman in 1983, the very same year, Harvey Gantt, got elected our mayor. He had a advanced degrees in urban planning. He was a great architect, great visionary. But we saw the opportunity the same way, and I wanted to make a city that would be more exciting. I mean, I've said it so much, people are tired of hearing me say, you could fire a shotgun down the street at five o'clock and not hit anybody. And uh, you couldn't buy a drink of liquor, you couldn't dance to live music. It was a very boring place. We, the first thing I, we did was start bringing activities downtown, like the symphony, the ballet. We backed up bringing the Hornets here when the first time they came here and later really put up 100% of the money to bring the football team here. We built the Center City and my really underlying reason for doing it was to attract talented people because I, we couldn't do what I wanted to do as a company without attracting talent. But then I fell in love with doing it. Well, I was going to say, I, that might be the impetus, but yeah. y your passion for it goes much yeah. more beyond uh, attracting talent. No, it's been much, a lot of fun. 
And you know you get stimulus from everywhere. Like people say, I, I laugh and say I've saved the symphony six times, but it really may be more than that. It's really because my wife loves symphonic music. <laughs> so you kind of, you get spurs of, and she loves ballet, and those are two things I put a lot of money into. And you are correct, I, I love my city. And I think of myself, I, I don't think of myself like I used to. When I first went off to the Marine Corps, I thought of myself as a Southerner. Not, and maybe a South Carolinian. I don't really think I thought of that, just mainly a Southerner. I very came home from the Marines as an American, and I still would day say I'm an American, but I'm a Charlottean. More than, even though I went to Chapel Hill and I live in North Carolina, I don't think about North Carolina like I think about Charlotte. So I love Charlotte, and so I want to, I spend all my time trying to find the answer to make it better. And right now, entrepreneurially, what really I'm working on is working with a lot of young entrepreneurs, particularly African-American entrepreneurs, trying to help them make connections. And recently, as last Friday, I had one making a presentation to a group of millionaires and um, to get money to take his company forward. He got smart, got everything, and he's making money, but he just needs capital. So I, I'm trying to use my connections now in the entrepreneurial world to help build up financial strength in our community at all levels of our community. Before we talk about the, the social aspects of building up you know, the arts and sciences, what can our business leaders do to help the entrepreneurs, the up and coming, entre the, the soon to be human calls? Well, I think the main thing they need to do is to give them the opportunity to put forward their ideas and then we need to see that we have enough money set aside in the, as a group to um, back the, the ideas that are clearly winners or clearly have a chance to be winners because you never know exactly. It's, it's, you need risk capital when there's risk, right. not you know when it's an easy deal because uh, that capital is easy to get once, you, once you've uh, proven, have a proven to. So we've always needed more risk capital here in Charlotte, and we've gotten better in, arguably in FinTech, we, we have more money available, but it's still not what it should be. I think there's an ethnic reason for it, and it's different from what people think. And part of it is that this area was settled by Germanic, so-called Pennsylvania Dutch, Germans, and Scots, and English, but a lot of Scots and Scots-Irish and Germans who are very conservative by nature. And then for years all around here, if you bought stock in First Union National Bank and NCNB and, and, and Duke, you could go on vacation because those companies were earning money and going up. You didn't have to take any risk. So you, you mentioned you know, the, the structure of our city uh, from a, a demographic a state of mind, but we're also a banking city. Yes. So how do we change that banking mindset so people are willing to take more of a risk with their money into some of these ideas? Well, it's very interesting because the banks, as you know, are under so much regulation today that it's almost taken the um, risk out of them. In other words, we've worked so hard as a nation to take the risk out of our banking sector. Well, when you take the risk out, it means they're not doing their job anymore of providing the risk capital that we need to go forward. So it's got to come from somewhere. And there are two things happening. We have non-banks that are trying to do that. And that's very risky for the country because you get people that actually don't know what they're doing, throwing a lot of money at an idea. And then the other thing that happens is it doesn't happen, and so good ideas go begging. I'm not sure I know the answer to it, but I see the problem clearly. Um, I will say this, the business community is doing its best to, to respond to the need for jobs and the need for job training and the need for money for housing. So this city's businesses are responding. The nurturing of uh, of entrepreneurs though is way down the list. And we need to somehow raise that profile. Now I think the universities uh, like Queens University and like the other universities here in the city can help by providing forums and then trying to bring investors to the forum to listen to pitches, four, five, 10 pitches. What our schools can do also and our 
I mean, one of the young men I'm talking to is we teaching them to do a better job on their elevator speech, that, that they're only going to get one chance to make a first impression. And that's a really important thing. How can our business leaders in the, in the large corporations and our entrepreneurs of small businesses give back to the community with the, I guess, the greatest return, not just for their business, but the greatest return for Well, them. I think that first it requires of our leaders, our corporate leaders, that they see the need and the, the reason for doing that. That they, they need to have the same, like you said, that I, the same impetus with me that it's, it helps you attract good people. It helps you. So first, two things should be available. Make the market better for the, for the business you do locally. And secondly, make the place, continue to make it a great place to live and raise a family so you can attract talent. So once they get to that stage, then I think they, they need to see, they need to figure out what they can do their company and get the best payback for both them and the city. My own th thinking is that, is that doing like Siemens does, which is take, take young people, train them, build it up, give them a job that takes them out of poverty immediately, and then they can buy their own house and they can do, educate their own children. So I'm, a, I'm in favor of job training is a number one thing that they can do. The why of it has got to be theirs. They've got to figure out, why do I want to do that? Why do I want to make this a better place to live? Well, the main damn reason to start with is you're living there. You've got your headquarters there. You've, you've got a reason to do it. You've decided to come here. And so you need to, everybody needs to keep in mind, it's my city and I want to make it a better place to live. That, that kind of gives me a, a really good into our last question. You spent time to make your bank the biggest bank. Yeah. You spent time to make your city a great city. What do you spend your time doing to make Huma call great? Well, I'm trying to be a better person um, and spend my energy that I have left, the life I have left, and the wealth I have left, uh, expend it in helping other people and helping lift other people. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I'm very appreciative of your time yeah. and for everything you've shared with us yeah. today. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash Nexogy Education or visit influencingentrepreneurs.com to catch up on previous episodes with Casimir Ward.